The theme of this year's Hackers Congress is a new order. Today, I want to share ways that we can begin to improve journalism as a practice towards something that is more accountable, vigorously evidence-based, and allows for a dispersion of interpretive power. But one cannot begin to talk about a new order without first dissecting and understanding the current one. What better way to do that than to quote someone who has been doing it for the last 20 or so years? While there exists a large literature in the structural or real politic analysis of key institutions of U.S. power, a range of ritualistic and even quasi-religious phenomena surrounding the national security sector in the United States suggest that these approaches alone lack explanatory power. These phenomena are familiar in the ritual of flag holding, the veneration of orders, and elaborate genuflection to rank. But they can be seen also in the extraordinary reaction to WikiLeaks disclosures, where it is possible to observe some of their more interesting features. When WikiLeaks publishes U.S. government documents with classification markings, a type of national security holy seal, if you will, two parallel campaigns begin. First, the public campaign of downplaying, diverting attention from, and reframing any revelations that are a threat to the prestige of the national security class, and second, an internal campaign within the national security state itself to digest what has happened. When documents carrying such seals are made public, they are transubstantiated into forbidden objects that become toxic to the state within a state. The more than 5.1 million Americans, as of 2014, with active security clearances, and those on its extended periphery who aspire to its economic or social patronage. While a given document can be read by cleared staff when it issues from classified government repositories, it is forbidden for the same staff to set eyes on the exact same document when it emerges from a public source. Should cleared employees of the national security state read such documents in the public domain, they are expected to self-report their contact with the newly profaned object and destroy all straight traces of it. This response is, of course, irrational. The classified cables and other documents published by WikiLeaks and associated media are completely identical to the original versions officially available to those with the necessary security clearance, since this is where they originated. They are electronic copies. Not only are they indistinguishable, there is literally no difference at all between them. Not a word, not a letter, not a single bit. The implication is that there is a non-physical property that inhabits the documents once they receive their classification markings, and that this magical property is extinguished, not by copying the document, but by making the copy public. Julian Assange from the introduction to the WikiLeaks files. The act of trying to understand how the world really works, especially the institutions which organize human civilization, is considered profanity to these agents of the state. But we should not pretend that only those under direct employment with the state can be its willing agents. What frustrates me about journalism, whether in print or online, is that there is a similar exclusionary hierarchy regarding source documents. There is the creator of the source material, and then there are media institutions who usually assume for themselves the right to interpret that source material and the state of the world for you while gatekeeping the original material that informed their interpretation, even when there is no reasonable source protection excuse. How many people even have the chance to assess the data for themselves and perhaps challenge the interpretation? The entire careers of many journalists depend on maintaining this hierarchy of exclusivity just as the state holds the power to determine which laws are in effect and which should be conveniently forgotten. In the past, journalists were understandably limited in the amount of source material they could make available to their readers. There is only so much information you can fit into a couple of pages of printed newspaper. But the internet changed that. Digital storage capacity changed that. Millions of documents can be accessible through a single website. Yet it appears that many journalists have not similarly evolved their practices to fit these new capabilities. One of the intrinsic advantages in using web platforms over print-based media is hyperlinking. You can cite every single claim you make, 
whether it be to a primary source document or simply a public tweet made a few seconds ago from a blue checkmarked account. But how many of them do this? How many of you have read an article in the last year which substantially or fully sourced all of the claims it made? I'm a very odd journalist in the sense that I spend more time fact-checking other journalists than I do writing my own pieces. In fact, some of my most popular and lengthy pieces originated from what I thought would be a simple correction. And after about three years of doing that in a very public way, I've come to understand that this stagnation in the evolution of journalism stems from a nasty cycle of corrupt incentives. Most journalists are not in the business of documenting the world. They're in the business of perception distortion, sometimes without realizing it. They, abu they abuse their position as gatekeepers between you, an influenceable and presumably ordinary citizen of a particular country or region, and the influencers who are powerful enough to make the changes worth documenting. Many so-called journalists are stenographers, hype merchants, because generating hype, even at the expense of the truth, gets them paid in the short term. Bloomberg, for example, pays their journalists a bonus if they write market-moving stories. The journalists who choose not to sacrifice the truth for hype are usually always under pressure, financially, socially, and if they're worthy enough, politically, to succumb to that tendency. Because if you upset the upper estates of the realm, you might just lose your press pass to the White House or whatever other kind of bone they've thrown to you. A substantial share of online journalism is funded through advertising, which is merely a nuisance at worst when it came in the form of ink and paper. But on the internet, it is more sinister because it has become a surveillance system. In fact, it relies on many of the same subtle and fundamental vulnerabilities in computer and network security that official surveillance systems do. From the moment you click on these ad-funded articles, your interaction with it is being cataloged in various ways and sent off to dozens of third parties. This data profile about you, but rarely ever shared with you, eventually feeds into the decision-making processes of those in influential business and national intelligence roles who design and or subvert these information systems. Journalism on the internet, in a sense, has become a Trojan horse. Every day you think you are being given this information free of charge about people of real interest and importance in the world. In reality, you are making a micropayment within a broader bundled transaction. Millions of people clicking and trading small bits of potentially sensitive data in exchange for a five or 10 minute read. If you haven't already, it is time to give up on this illusion that you are not worth documenting, that you are not worth surveilling. The price of living under that illusion is unevenly distributed, but you are still paying for it. Depending on what media you follow, you may be paying for your own perception of reality to be distorted in favor of someone else's unknown end. One of the primary motivations behind those in the so-called fifth estate is to act as a check on the fourth estate, the mainstream press, when it in turn fails to act as a check on the three other estates of the realm. And while I do see those in the fifth estate taking sourcing much more seriously, because without being backed by this aura of institutional authority, they are only considered seriously if they prove themselves in other ways, there is still a lot left to be desired in terms of evidence-based reporting. More than two years ago, I proposed a model called revision-controlled journalism. You could say it is a revitalization of the concept of open-source journalism, where it utilizes version control systems for the purposes of contemporaneous timestamping and tracking changes to a story. Ideally, this model would be implemented using open source intelligence, open source software, and copyleft or Creative Commons licensing within an open participatory network of readers and other journalists who want to collaborate on investigations. The first investigation that I did using a few elements of the model, such as the open source intelligence aspect especially, was an interesting learning experience about what was possible when journalism is approached in this fashion. Many people, including those who were in fact subjects of the investigation, would ask me what my opinion was on the topic, 
which in short dealt with questions of innocence or guilt. They asked me this because even though I had typed thousands of words in public over the course of more than two years, any biases I had were apparently not evident enough to make a conclusion about what I personally believed. Transparency perhaps changes the writing process. But I made clear in my second document published on the model that this is not about objective journalism, but transparency in narrative formation. This isn't about being free from bias, but rather making narrator biases as evident as possible. Trusting the narrator's interpretation and reputation becomes optional in a way that matters. Don't trust, verify. This is still a very new idea and an even newer implementation of an idea. My goal is to create, at the very least, an application which integrates all of the tools necessary for any journalist to do what I have done so far and more, even if they are non-technical and get a glassy look in their eye when you mention Git. The great thing is that most of the necessary tools already exist. Git, Bitcoin, open timestamps for version control, archive systems, services like Keybase for an identity management layer, of course, you can always choose to remain anonymous. And database archive software like Looking Glass. Someday, I hope to see a kind of journalistic pirate bay for torrenting your way out of the information hierarchy. If you would like to join me in building or testing this new order, please reach out. You will find more links in the description.